Welcome to Fireside Nets, brought to you by me, Spen Harris, your host. This is a Brooklyn Nets podcast for all your news, Nets information, breakdown, reactions, and so much more. Unfortunately, this season it's been a lot more negative than positive, but we are joined by our Nets insider for the last time this regular season, and that is C.J. Holmes, senior writer for New York Daily News. CJ, what's going on? Not much, Ben. How are you? Can't complain. Uh, we're we're in April. You know, we got March Madness going on for the men's and the women's. That's been fun. That's been really fun to watch. I'm a Yankees fan, so Yankees baseball has been been great. Mets baseball, not so much. You got the draft in the NFL this month, and oh yeah, that's right. The Nets are are still playing meaningless basketball in uh, in April. So I, I I guess that's kind of fun. I hear you, man. I hear you. All right. So so we can get right into it. The Nets are, are coming off uh, a back-to-back Lakers, Pacers, both losses. We'll start with last night's debacle in Indiana. This game was over from, from tip. Uh, the Nets absolutely stood no chance. 133-111 was the final. I, I think the only fun part of the game was when Jalen Smith uh, almost killed Dennis Schroeder after Schroeder knocked off his goggles. Uh, this, this to me seemed like a case of the Pacers are warming up for the playoffs. They're, they're going to be in there no matter what. And the Nets are, are ready for this season to be over. Was there anything else you saw from, from this game worth calling out? You know, the saddest thing about yesterday's game for the Nets is kind of like what you said. Um, The Pacers, you know, while things could change marginally in terms of seeding for them, they're locked into a playoff spot, right? And you can make an argument that they don't have much to play for other than to make sure they're ready for the postseason. And the Nets, I mean, they still have a lot to play for. Um, It's not impossible. Um, They're not quite out of the running. (laughs) Um, uh, for the uh, last playing spot in the Eastern Conference. And you would think that after coming out flat-footed in the first quarter against the Lakers, they'd try to rectify that um, the next game, you know. And weird things happen. And back-to-back sets, um, teams are tired. It's definitely not easy going from playing a game at Barkley Center to go all the way to Indiana to play another game the next night. But – to see the level of it, 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 it to me, it, it wasn't just it, it wasn't just you know. Usually, when they start slow, a lot of the times is they're just not making shots. But it was so much more than that last night. I mean, the transition defense was terrible. Um, they couldn't guard the three point line either. They couldn't guard the paint. I mean, they were completely disengaged from the task at hand, and you know. Pacers are a better team, you know, call it what it is, but to have a game like you had against the Lakers and then to come out the next night and display little to no fight, um, it's, it's, it's disappointing. Um, I'm sure uh, interim head coach Kevin Ollie's disappointed his team's effort too because um, yesterday that's kind of what it came down to. I mean, they still shot around like, what, 44% for the game. They were making shots, but they they, they made some shots. I'll say that, but – they didn't do anything else, right? And it's disappointing. No disappointing fact is, you know, they had won three in a row, right? Um, they were engaged. You know, they were making shots. They were playing strong defense. And then over these last two to just completely lay down, it's kind of like a microcosm of this season. Um, when they're locked in and engaged, they're, they're a competitive team. Um but when they have game, when they come out playing like they did the last two nights, they're one of the worst in the league. There's no way around it. Yeah, you think of how the first half of the season ended with the 50 point loss against the Celtics. Jacques Vaughn loses his job after that, and and you know maybe if they were more competitive in that game, maybe if it's a seven point loss and instead of a 50 point loss, you let Vaughn ride out the rest of the season. Uh, but this game against the Pacers, it it had a similar taste in its mouth to that game against the Celtics. Obviously, you don't lose by 50, but at no point in this game were the Nets really competitive. There were a lot of just Nets would score, quick, fast break, bucket by the Pacers without really any resistance on defense. 
There was the the missed free throw that uh, Watford just was standing there, and I forget who it was. Maybe it was Toppin, but someone on the Pacers got an easy rebound for the putback. Those little effort plays, you have to look at the coach, and you have to say, why are these guys not prepared? Why are they not putting in that effort, right? Like, that's – that's part of it. That's part of the NBA and that's part of coaching. So to everybody who who wanted Vaughn gone and, and were in favor of Ollie, not saying that Ollie's a bad coach, but these are the types of losses that if, if Kevin Ollie wants a chance to be the guy next year, it, it's going to be tough for him to get that opportunity with losses like these. Um, Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think Ollie is making the best of a bad situation. You know, obviously it means a lot for him to get a chance to, you know, lead an NBA team. But the fact of the matter is there, I don't think this is on Ollie. I don't think it was on Vaughn. Um, it's these players, man. Um, and their inability to, you know, consistently compete <laughs> on any given night. Now, granted, they have to deal with a lot of injuries. They're not, you know, whole as they should be, but, you know, at a certain point, you know, pride should be a factor. And I just don't get a sense with this team. Um, I think they're content with where they're at, despite what they say in press conferences. Um, and when a team struggles like this, you question how together they are, right? Um, you're supposed to come together in moments like these. You're supposed to come together and rally when you have a chance to make the postseason. And they just they just can't do it. Um and it, it sucks for Kevin Ollie um, because, you know, obviously they're going to look at, you know, this post all star break slate of games. And, you know, from a front office standpoint, they're going to see not much has changed, if anything. Um, it's just as bad as when Vaughn was here, right? And right. So I, I, you know, maybe Ollie can, you know, do better with a better roster when given the opportunity, but it's, it's just a poorly constructed roster. Um, there's going to be a lot of radical change with this team. Um, I imagine this off season, it's going to start with the head coaching position. I think they're, I think that, um, Sean Marks will keep his word and cast a wide net in a coaching search. And from there, I think it's going to be a big, big personnel shakeups up and down the roster. Um, once again, it's going to, I think it's going to be a completely new look team next year, um, led by a new head coach. Before we move on to the Lakers, uh, the Lakers game on Sunday, just a little bit more about Dennis Schroeder. You, you talk about pride and showing fight. He has been one of the only guys in this team, night in, night out, to show that fight. He got into it with Jalen Smith. He's been in a few kerfuffles in the second half of the season since he's been traded to Brooklyn. Are you surprised that that he's kind of stepped up as, as sort of a short-term leader on this team? And, and are you impressed with the fact that you know, you, you saw what you were getting from Dinwiddie, and obviously he's doing what he's doing in L.A. now, but did you see Schroeder being this big of a of a contributor um, in the second half of the year? Well, in terms of Schroeder's, you know, effort and fiery, you know, nature, that's always been who he is, so that doesn't surprise me. I am surprised that, you know, he's been able to capture, um, you know, such a significant leadership role in this team in such a short amount of time, but then again, you um, people are given the mantle of leadership when they're playing well. And he's been one of the only nets that's been consistent. I mean, uh, I haven't looked at the numbers, but this has to be the best he shot from three, you know, maybe in his career, like in terms of like the stretch of games, it's ridiculous, right? Oh, not ridiculous, but like, you know, for him, right. this is way above average. So not, not, I, I am surprised by that. Um, but you know, in terms of the fire and the fight, that's just always been who Schroeder was dating back to his days with the Atlanta Hawks. So that's just who he is on a 99 out basis. But for him to, you know, he's playing good, right? So usually your team's best players are the guys that other guys will look to for leadership. So, I mean, that probably has a lot to do with why he's been able to command uh, respect so quickly. Shout out to Dennis Schroeder. We're, we're going to get into uh, into it when we talk about the three wins the Nets had, but he's been one of the few bright spots for this team. Uh, going over to the Lakers-Nets game on Sunday, Lakers 116, Nets 104. Uh, the Nets got off to one of the worst starts to any basketball game I've seen. What was the count? It was it was 17-0 to start the game? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty bad. Four. Yeah, I think it was 20. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's times where, I mean – during during that early run, I was jumped up like, are they going to score in the first quarter? I mean, 
like just bad. It's just like they have so many unexplainable lapses, like mental lapses, right? Um, and I know, you know, we're not making shots, we're not making shots, but like get it inside. Someone be prideful. Someone go get a bucket, right? And that's been kind of an issue with this team when you know when when. when I don't want to say elite production, but like when you need a bucket at the worst time, like who's going to step up? And there hasn't been one clear cut guy um, all year long. Maybe that was Mikael Bridges earlier in the season, but he hasn't been that guy post All Star break. Um, you know, Cam Thomas is you know putting up pretty good numbers, right? But you know, how many situations have he been in where he's had to be like be clutch? You know. So. Not a ton. Not a ton. I think if you, you can argue that Schroeder has had more clutch moments in the second half than Cam Thomas. Um, let's recognize greatness where, where we can. LeBron James, 40 points, nine out of 10 three pointers, a career best from three. I, I feel like, CJ, it's a recurring theme that superstars tend to just show up and destroy the Nets. Um, and, and LeBron. Have continue- no start the counter. I mean, it's an issue that. You know, yeah. When you play a team with stars, they're going to get theirs. That's why they're superstars. But the Nets don't have anyone who could counter. They they got nobody. You had and 40. In some nights, right? But, like. but even in tonight, you know, in this game, 30 points. He was 8 of 22 from the field. Those aren't good shooting numbers, right? That's, that's, that's a terrible percentage. You had three guys on the Lakers in, in Anthony Davis, Rui Hachimura, and LeBron James scored 20-plus. D'Angelo Russell had 18 and for the Nets, it was Cam Thomas with 30, and your next highest guy was Dennis Schroeder with 14. You can't win basketball games like that. So shout out to LeBron. That was, I, I mean, you know, obviously I'm rooting for the Nets, but some of those threes he hit were, were just friggin' ridiculous. Um, all right. I want to I want to talk about the three wins because for about a few days, the Nets were actually fun to watch. At Toronto, 96-88. At Washington, 122-119. And then home against Chicago, 125-108. For me, that Chicago win was the best. Chicago's going to be a playing team probably. You know, DeMar DeRozan, uh, Kobe White's having a really good year. They still got Vucevic on that team, Alex Caruso. They got some decent players. But that was probably one of the best games from a player standpoint in the second half. And, you know, you had Cam Thomas, Dennis Schroeder, and Mikhail Bridges all scoring 25 or more. And then shout out to Kevin Ollie. It, it seemed like that was probably his biggest win or one of his biggest wins in the second half of the season. So just talk to me a little bit about that Chicago win. If, if you saw anything different in that game that we just haven't really seen consistently uh, throughout the second half. I mean, they were just extremely balanced. Like you said, three guys with 25 points or more. Um you know, like, like like you just said about the Lakers, when you get three guys scoring 20, you're probably going to win the basketball game, right? Um, and then, like, I don't know how it's to spin it. They just got hot. You know, the same way they've had a lot of those nights or just missing everything, that was just one of those halves that, you know, come around maybe once or twice a season that they just got hot. I mean, I haven't seen anything like that, you know, since they played Chicago uh, when I first started, you know what I'm saying? And that's back when, you know, this team still had a lot of hope, you know, around it, around it. And it's just kind of like an example of like what this team can be when they are locked in, when they are playing unselfishly, when they are sharing the basketball. And what Kevin, like, I'll tell you, I asked Kevin Ollie, you know, you know, how do you replicate this? And obviously you can't replicate making 25 threes. You can't replicate making 18 threes in the second half, right? It's just, like I said, it's just, Sometimes you just get lucky like that. But what Kevin said is the process can be replicated, you know, playing unselfishly, moving the basketball, executing, um, knocking it down when you're open. That can be replicated. Right. But, you know, when you speak of that process, um, they hadn't they hadn't done it these last two games. Um, I don't know if it's complacency or you know, matchups or whatever, but they should at the net at the very least. Um, should be that team every night, you know, at the very least. Not making 25 threes, but, you know, you know, they know they don't have any superstars. Like, they know they don't have the best personnel. And How do you win with less? You execute better. You play harder, right? Um, you cut sharper. 
Uh, you crash the glass with more ferocity. Like that's how you make up for those shortcomings. And the, the, the biggest issue with this Nets team is they haven't been able to channel that, you know, level of focus across the board consistently enough this season. And the record speaks for it. Yeah, I think I think that's an excellent way to put it. Um, those, those wins, the games, you know, the wins against Chicago, those have been the blips on the radar because for the most part, the the standard this season for Brooklyn has been games like we watched against the Lakers, like we watched against the Pacers. It, it's It's been a lot more losses than wins and, and relatively lopsided losses at that. Um, I wanted to get into, you know, a few guys, more, more player specific, trending up. I want to start with Cam Thomas. Uh, started the season really, really strong, got hurt, came back from the ankle injury, was a little bit inefficient when he first came back. But in this second half, especially, especially, especially in March, he has found his rhythm, 26.8 points per game in March. He has been the leading man. He, he he's, he's been the best scorer and, and probably the best player on this Nets team. Uh, what have you seen from Cam Thomas that that you've really liked in the second half of basketball for the Nets? It's not necessarily what Cam has done on the court that's impressed me. It's his demeanor off of it. I mean, when we speak to him in press conferences, uh, it might be a little rushed to some of the things he says, but it, it, it seems like he has a better pulse of, like, you know, what's going on, you know, compared to other people. I mean, you know, He's really the guy saying, you know, we got to focus on the next game, get the next wins. And even after the Chicago game, it's just one game, you know, we're not done yet. It's, it, so I guess it's just his maturity as a 22 year old that has stood out to me. And it's being reflected in his play. I mean, in many ways, he's been the Nets' leader um, in some ways, at least, you know, on the court for a lot of the second half of the season. Um, he, he's definitely been their voice, I would say. And they've put him up on the uh, podium, you know more frequently than they did over the first half of the year. So um, that's kudos to Cam. Um, you know, I hope he continues to show this growth. I'm not one of the people that says that, you know, Cam can't be a star in this league. Um, buckets are buckets. You know, say what you want about other aspects of his game, but, you know, his ability to put the ball in the hole is it, it, it is pretty special. And when he's on, it's 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 quite, quite fun to watch. Um, so... I know Cam knows that he needs to improve in different areas. He's already showcased some of that improvement here down the stretch. Um, Ollie's given him more looks to point guard, which, which should you know only help his development in that regard. So, you know, the sky's the limit for Cam Thomas, man. Um, it's really going to come down to you know how good he wants to be because you know he he's so talented and, he, and he's so gifted and he's so young. And um, I hope that he can retain this mindset going forward and really get the most out of his abilities because he can be special if he wants to be. When it comes to Cam Thomas, I think about the beginning of the season when he was coming off the bench and he was putting up 30 a night. And I think about that one game against the Mavericks where Luca hit that ridiculous, what was it, the left-handed bank shot for three yeah. to win the game. If the Nets win that game, Cam Thomas is the hero of that game. Because I remember, you know, I don't remember the stats, but he was going pound for pound with Luka. And I said to myself, if he's if he's going pound to pound with Luka Doncic, who's arguably the best player in the world right now, he's going to be a star. And you talked about, you know, the areas that he's got to improve on, where he's gotten a little bit better, his decision-making, his passing. It just seems like all around he's becoming a much better basketball player and not just a, a better scorer. I'd like to see him, you know, with a full offseason, the Nets knowing what his role is next year, because let's face it, I don't think they thought he was going to be the leading scorer going into this year, but that's how it's going to end up. So I'd, I'd like to see them with one off one full offseason where they say, hey, Cam, like this is your role next season. Let's practice this from from July, June, whenever the offseason starts to, to uh, September, October, and let's get you in a position to be – the guy, if not the second guy on this team. Continuity matters. Um, you know, Cam said it himself. It feels a lot like a rookie year to him. Um, more opportunity than he's ever had. So, you know, with that comes a learning curve. And you're starting to see here over these final games that, you know, he's starting to come around the bend a little bit. Um, so kudos to Cam Thomas. And, you know, like I said, hopefully he keeps developing um, and, you know, pushing his game to new heights because he's definitely capable of it. 
Next guy on the trending up list, Trendon Watford. Speaking of trending, Hmm. Watford has been averaging 15.6 points per game the last several games. He's just, he's a guy that he was playing, then he wasn't playing. Now he's playing again. But whenever he's on the court, the hustle's there, the energy's there. He can finish around the rim. His three point shot has gotten a little better as the season's progressed. What have you seen from from Trendon Watford uh, recently? And is there any chance that you think he's going to still be a net next year? Yeah, man. I mean, I'm I'm in the camp that I think Trendon should have been playing more all year, all year, simply because of the fact that as a bigger guy, his overall skill set is something that no one else on the roster has. Um, what is he about six 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 seven? Um, big body. Uh, uh, really, he's a point guard in my opinion, in a forward's body. Um, he's really six good. nine, Trendon Watford. Yeah, yeah, six nine. I mean, really good distributor. Um, just sees the game really well, has a really good feel. I mean, now his three-point shot is coming along a little bit. Uh, I just think that his versatility um, could have been showcased a lot more for this Nets team this year, especially during the times when you know Ben Simmons was injured because, you know, although he's no Ben Simmons as a passer, he brings a lot of the same qualities to the table in, term, in that point-forward mold. That makes sense. I think if anything, the biggest knock on Watford is, you know, maybe his defense. But even that, he's been playing pretty hard these last couple of games. And will he be a net next year? Uh, maybe. I mean, I know the front office is paying attention to his, you know, a little late season bloom. But you know, the good thing is, if you want to keep Watford around, it probably won't be that expensive. Um, not that I don't think that you know every guy deserves to you know make a ton of money in this league, but. Um, if you want to bring Watford back, you know, he, he could be able to, you know, he could probably be had on a team friendly deal and then heading the next year, you know, kind of like Cam, hopefully this carries over and the Nets are better overall because of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would love to bring him back next year. He, he's a guy that I just, on a team without a lot of fight, he is one of those guys that has fought this year. Uh, So we talked about two players trending up. We got to get to the two guys trending down. And sort of the opposite of Trendon Watford has been Lonnie Walker. Minutes are down as of late, not playing as much under Ollie as he did under Vaughn. What can you tell me uh, about Lonnie Walker and and, and sort of this disappointing end to the season for a guy who was a potential six-man of the year candidate earlier this year? Yeah, I really feel for Lonnie. It's been a rough year for him. It seems like, you know, every time he's playing his best, he gets hurt, misses time. And then, you know, as a shooter like he is, it takes a little while to regain your game rhythm. And, you know, and, and in that process of trying to regain your rhythm, he's, you know, slowly and slowly, you know, slowly and slowly been, you know, removed from the rotation. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what's happened to Lonnie – this season's to no fault of his own, you know, like I mentioned the injuries, but you know, now he's just in a tough situation. Ollie's trying to put guys on the floor that are productive right now. And Lonnie just hasn't been that. Um, he played a little better yesterday, but I mean, yeah. what does it mean to, what does it truly mean to play well in a 30 point loss? You know what I'm saying? Right. right. Or, you know, 25, whatever it was, but um, it sucks. And, you know, I know, you know, I know he's frustrated because he's in a contract year. Um, and with this poor ending to the season might likely mean that he'll be elsewhere next year as well. And like you said, it's just a shame because he was playing so well to start the year. It was in the sixth man of the year conversation. He was leading the league in 20 point games off the bench. I mean, the guy was, the guy was really having a resurgent year after, you know, after, you know, stints in San Antonio and with the Lakers. And um, I, j- I just hope wherever Lonnie ultimately does land, he can get back to what he is and stay what he can be at full health and stay healthy and, you know, stay healthy. Cause you know, he's a great guy. Um, he's a hard worker. You know, when we were at shoot around, he's, he, you know, he's one of the guys in the gym putting up extra shots. Um, and you just want to see a guy like that succeed. Um, so yeah, and it's, it's just, it's just crazy. Just another, another, another crazy element of a crazy net season, you know? I, I think in any other season where the nets are competitive, he's the perfect player off the bench he's the perfect compliment but unfortunately with the Nets losing so much you got to get looks at guys like Jalen Wilson you got to get younger guys like Trendon Watford and they're not that Lonnie Walker's not young but 
you, you know, I, I understand why he's fallen out of the rotation. You got to see what else you have. And it sucks that he's going to end up elsewhere because there were moments this season that he was the most consistent scorer for the Nets, whether it was when Cam Thomas went down or, or Mikhail Bridges uh, play started to uh, decline a little bit. Um, I, I, I don't think there's a Nets fan out there who didn't love Lonnie Walker for the majority of this season. So it, it, it's going to suck to if, if he does leave and it seems like that's likely, but uh, shout out to Lonnie, man. I don't, I don't think anyone is, is looking at him saying he had a disappointing year because of him. I, I think you nailed it when you said it's been injuries, it's been the rotation and uh, the fact that they just haven't been playing winning basketball, his type of play lends to winning basketball. You know, he can go out there, you, you give him 30 minutes, he's going to maybe score 25, but in a loss, what does that matter? You, you got to see what you have in, in young guys like Jalen Wilson, Trenton Watford. And so I, I get it. And a guy like Dennis Smith Jr. Who does other things other than play offense on the defensive side of the ball. Um, yeah. All right. And then the last guy I, I wanted to talk about and pretty much the rest of the podcast will be about this one guy is, is Mikhail Bridges. Another dud against the Lakers. I think he only had like 13 points in that game. He played a little bit better against Indiana, but I, I've seen on Twitter, you know, people are saying he's reverted back to more of a three and, and D guy the, these last few games. Um, I don't know. Is, is there any sort of idea that maybe the Nets and their fans overvalued Mikael Bridges this year? Or, or, or what can you tell me about him in the second half of the year? I think for sure. And, you know, I've said this before, like, you know, you know, dating even dating back to Bridges' days at Villanova, like he's never been like a number one scoring option. He wasn't in Phoenix. In Phoenix, his bread and butter was cutting to the rim, playing defense, knocking down open threes, um, knocking down the you know fifteen footers off the short curls. That was his game, and like he was made better by having guys like Devin Booker and Chris Paul around him, right? Um, but you know, he's traded to the Nets and a team that doesn't have a star, doesn't have a lot of talent. Um, he's the biggest name on the roster. Um, you know, probably the best overall player in terms of complete skill set. And, you know, when you're thrown onto a team as poorly constructed as this, like, you know, they're going to turn to you. They're going to be like, you know, you got to be the guy. And I think for a while, um, especially when Mikel first got on the roster um, right after the trade and, you know, early parts of this season, he looked like he could be a guy to, you know, take that next step. I'm not saying he's a number one option or anything, but to be a, you know, um, a more reliable score, a more, a higher volume score in the NBA, but, you know, I don't want to say he was like pretending, but he was just doing what he's asked to do. And, you know, as the season goes on, you know, teams are finding better ways to defend him and game plan against him. And, you know, he's kind of reverting back to what he always was. I mean, how many 30 point games did Bridges have in Phoenix? Like not a lot, you know what I'm saying? Um, so, I mean, it's just a confusing situation because you know what he can be because we've seen it, what he can be when he's, you know, knocking down shots and being that alpha um, kind of guy. But at the same time, like, that isn't who he sh should have to be. And he's the guy that he is right now out of circumstance, right? And, I mean, it wasn't sustainable, <laughs> Like he, he has some hot streaks, but it's just not, it just wasn't sustainable because that's just not who he is. I'm not saying Mikael Bridges is trash or and stuff like that. He's a very very good NBA player, very valuable NBA player, um, according to the Houston Rockets. But um, well, reportedly, uh, to, according to the Houston Rockets. Uh, but you know, the Rockets, if they were to make that trade for Mikael, they weren't bringing him in saying, "Okay, this is your team now." Go get his twenty five, and I know they bring they'll bring him in because he's a good veteran three and D piece that can take a young team to another level. Um, but you know that will you know, but they're gonna look to Jalen Green for scoring. Um, they're gonna look to guys like Alfred Sangoon for scoring. Like that's not that wouldn't have been Bridges' purpose, um, and that will kind of be his role on a lot of teams in the NBA because you know the truth is. You know, a championship contending team, Mikel Bridges isn't your best player and probably isn't your second best player. Um, 
you know, he a lot was put on his shoulders in Brooklyn this season because the roster was poorly constructed, and it's as simple as that, honestly. Yeah, you, you brought up that Rockets trade. I, I live in an alternative reality right now where the Nets somehow get Jalen Green plus picks. The future looks a lot different right now if, if, if you make that trade, if that was a real trade. Now, obviously, it was reported. We don't know, but that's a move that might lose a general manager his job if he doesn't make a trade like that. Uh, Jug Artist 14 writes, it's been McCone Bridges since December. Oh, it's been McCone Brick jizz since december all right yeah he's he hasn't been great and then the other kind of alternative reality i look at uh cj is okay the nets make that trade for mikhail they K- kd goes to phoenix what if mikhail plays how he's playing now when the nets first acquired him if he wasn't that alpha if he wasn't leading them to that whatever play i think the off season's completely different i think they build the team completely different it was fool's gold in a way that it sort of tricked Sean Marks. Look, I understand that the plan has always been you take this season, you wait, you try to go get Donovan Mitchell, you try to go get Giannis or Luka in a few years if one of those guys become available. I get that's the plan. But in a weird way, Mikhail playing out of his mind to start his Nets career, it almost set the Nets back a little bit. Because then you look at a trade like Jalen Green and, 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 and first round, second round picks, and you say, nah, we're good. And now if that trade's proposed tomorrow, you take that trade in a heartbeat. So it's just, it's like you said, it's such a weird situation that he was, he was so good out of this to, to start his career in the beginning of this, this season. Well, I mean, look at Dennis Schroeder, like he gets traded all of a sudden he's a, like a high level three point shooter. Sometimes like switching right. teams gives you that new that change in environment gives you a little bit of juice, but eventually, you know, in a lot of cases, you will revert back to, you know, what you always were, you know, once that, right. you know, once the juice kind of wears off, you know? No, I think, and, I think that's fair. You um, know, people want to say, oh, Mikel's tired, all this stuff. If Mikel Bridges was tired, Mikel Bridges yeah. would not play. Like, yeah, 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 time, yeah, Mikel yeah. Bridges is a professional athlete. And back in the day, guys were playing all 82, like way more consistently than now. So if anything, Nets fans should be like happy that he's putting his body out there on the line every day. But it's not a matter of being tired. It's just a matter of, you know, what he actually is being revealed, if you ask me. Um, I, I think DeMar DeRozan has more minutes than Mikhail. So so why don't you use the excuse for him? He's been in the league forever. You know what I'm saying? Like I that, that whole guys get tired thing, like uh, maybe it's true sometimes, but you can't use that excuse the entire season. Like Mikhail Bridges – isn't scoring 25 a night consistently because he's tired. Mikael Bridges isn't scoring 25 a night consistently because that's not who he is. <laughs> that, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to dump too much on Mikael. He did. He was nominated for teammate of the year finalist. So just want to send Mikael a congratulations. You know, obviously. Him, yeah. Yeah. Shout out to him. Uh, teammate dude. of the year finalist. Great dude. Go vote for him. Um, all right. So regular season done, players done. We look ahead to this offseason. Percentage chance that Donovan Mitchell is a Brooklyn net this offseason. Zero. Next offseason. Or sometime in the season. I just, you know, unless the guy simply just wants to live in New York, I don't see – why he would leave Cleveland. They're way closer to winning a championship than the Nets will be in the next 10 years. Um, They have pieces there, right? They're only a few pieces away (laughs) from true championship contention. And I know it's not the most glamorous market, you know, the play in in Cleveland, but, you know, if he cares about winning, I don't see why he would leave that situation. Um, And you know that the Cavs are going to throw as much money at him as he wants, (laughs) So it, it won't be a matter of money. I feel like it's it, it's going to be a matter of, you know, you know, how does he want his legacy to be defined? Do, you know, is he a guy that you know that's striving to win championships? And if that is the case, then I don't see any reason why he would want to come play for the Nets at the way that you know the organization is right now, um, unless he just you know wanted to live the New York life. I just don't see it. Why, why okay. would, why would, you know, they're going to, they're going to be some guys who just want a bag and, you know, they'll take the bag from the nets, but 
you know, respectfully, why would anyone want to play for a franchise in this state and expect to contend for anything? You know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I think that's fair. And obviously, you know, you have another team across the river. We're not going to mention their name, but they're a little bit closer to uh, winning a championship than the Nets are right now. So I get it. Zero percent chance is low. I'd like if you'd said like one percent, I would have would have made me slightly happy. But I, I get it. I get it. It's a shit situation right now in Brooklyn. Uh, so we, we look at the head coach. We look at the general manager, Kevin Ollie and Sean Marks. What does their job status look like? with six games left in the season, is, is there any sort of rumblings that this might be it for Marks or, or the opposite? The only people I've heard anything like nothing about Marks's job security has come out from the nets. You know, a lot of the frustration is from the fans, from what I've seen. Um, and like, here's the thing, like, I mean, you know better than I do. And like, you know, if, if I'm wrong, let me know. But like, the Nets have been consistently a playoff team at the very least, you know, in Mark's tenure. And it hasn't necessarily been pretty all the time, but, you know, they weren't mad at him when he brought the big three in. That was only, what, a couple of years ago. And when you lose all that star power, a down year is expected. I think what makes fans the most angry is that, you know, no GM has been perfect. I mean, I, I was just covering the Warriors. Not even Bob Myers was perfect, right? Now, granted, he won four championships, but, you know, he'll help the Warriors win four championships. But, you know, like, it's a tough job. And, you know, a down year had to be expected after you lose, you know, those three feature Hall of Famers. I, I think I think what frustrates Nets fans the most is they saw early in the year what this team could be when they're firing on all cylinders. But the fact of the matter is this roster was like, is a Frankenstein's monster of assets bought back in those trades. They, and these pieces don't necessarily fit together. And there's only so much you can do in this situation in terms of like rebuilding a competitive roster. So I think a down year was expected. I would, I would give it one more year until like, I'm, you know, ready to, you know, you know, come for Marx's or, you know, question, you know, Marks is like job, things of that nature. I give it one more year, see what they can do this off season. But, you know, to – I think that the good Marks has bought to the franchise might outweigh the bad. And I think to call for his job after, you know, one down year is, you know, it's a little much. <laughs> And, and here's see, the thing, if KD saying. doesn't step, if KD's shoe size is a little bit smaller, that's going to have a championship, in, uh, you know, within these last five years. So, I mean, my, my hot take is they lose in the next round or they lose to Phoenix in the, in the championship. Um, I, I understand what you're saying. I don't necessarily disagree. I know a lot of Nets fans have the perspective that the big three not working out was Marx's fault. Now, I don't necessarily have that perspective, but I, I think when – when fans, when Nets fans look at the bad, they say, how the F, I can curse on my own podcast, how the fuck can you lose three of a, of the top 10 players in the league within a year of each other and come back and put this shit out on the court? So that's their perspective. I, I mean, you got to give them credit for getting those three guys here and building a culture that lured Kyrie and Kevin and eventually lured James Harden from Houston. Um, but I do, I do think that that's why fans, you, you know, some fans, not all fans, but some fans call for Marx's job because of the fact that it, it led to this Frankenstein's monster of a roster due to the fact that you lost three superstars, two of them in the prime of their careers, one a little bit past, but you get it. No. Um, all right. We talked about Marx, Kevin Ollie, you know, I, I percentage wise, he's the head coach next year. What do you think? Maybe like 40. 40? You know, 40-ish. You know, like I said, who knows? Maybe the Nets win these final six in a row and the Hawks falter down the stretch and they get into the play-in tournament and go on a run. Unlikely. It's like a negative 2% chance that happens. But um, You're saying there's a chance. But um, I do think that the Nets, you know, it, it, it's one thing if, you know, it's one thing if, Ali is like six, seven games above 500 since taking over. 
Um, but he's not. Like I said, it's just as bad as the on-court product is just as bad as it was when Vaughn's here. And, you know, because of that, there wasn't a drastic shift. Um, I do think that they're going to keep their word and, um, you know, cast a wide net you know, in that coaching search this offseason. You know, maybe Ollie still emerges to be the, you know, best option, you know, when it's all said and done. But I do think the team will ultimately go in a different direction. And But I do think the players are – you know, at, on some level, appreciate Ollie in the locker room. They respond to him. So maybe it's a scenario where they bring in a new head coach while Ollie stays on staff um, in Brooklyn. Maybe it's something like that. But I, I do think there's a better chance of the team deciding to go in a completely different regra- direction um, with head coach than, you know, just handing the keys over to Ollie. I just don't think there has been enough improvement to warrant that without a formal coaching search. Yeah, and, and to piggyback off what you just said, if if the Nets do decide to go in another direction, you know, I don't think this is the last we hear of Kevin Ali as a head coach. I think that he inherited a really bad situation with the second half of, of of basketball and the Nets just continuing to lose the way they they lost towards the end of the first half of the of the year. Um, he's a proven champion on the collegiate level with UConn. He he's a really likable guy. Players seem to respect him. I can see him getting an assistant position somewhere else and eventually getting another look at head coach in in a much better situation where he's not sort of you, you know, was, he almost had to have a miracle for this second half Nets team to, to be yeah. good, to, to have a chance to to keep that permanent head coaching job. So uh I don't think if he's not the Nets head coach this this next year, I don't think this is the last we hear of Kevin Ollie as a head coach in the NBA. I did just want to point that out. Um, all right, final question, CJ. This was, and then we're done with, with the show for this year. Uh, and we thank you so much for, for coming back on, you know, every month. If, for those who don't know, CJ Holmes was our recurring Nets insider for the entire season. So shout out to him. What were, what was your favorite thing about covering the Brooklyn Nets this year? And what was your least favorite thing? Hmm. This might sound a little silly, but my favorite part about covering the Brooklyn Nets was just going to work every day, hopping on the subway, you know, going through New York City, you know, popping out at, at the uh, Atlantic Avenue stop and you know, coming up the escalator and seeing Barclay Center and all its glory just right in front of me. And, you know, I, I, um, the facilities are probably my favorite part about uh, covering the team this season. And just the least part about it is just, you know, the losing. Um, no reporter wants to cover team that's losing. Now, granted, my check's still clear regardless. <laughs> but um, when you're covering a team, obviously you're supposed to be, you know, non-biased. But being around an organization, the players, coaches every day, it's kind of like an extension of family. And, you know, when your family's not doing well – you're not doing too well, is if that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? And you know, when when you're when teams are winning, everything is fun. Guys are lighter. Guys want to talk more in the locker room. You get more, you know, stories. But you know, when a team's losing, um, guys don't want to talk that much. The vibes are you know a little sour. Um, it's harder to get those, you know, positive, you know, human interest pieces that you know I love to tell. So from that aspect, it's been challenging. Um, uh, I've never covered a team that's lost this many games. Uh, I guess I, I covered the Arizona Cardinals the year Sam Bradford was quarterback. But, uh, nah, man, never never covered a team that's, you know, struggled this much. And I, I covered the Suns a little bit uh, before they uh, – I, I, I moved to Tucson to cover the Cats um, the year they, you know, got Chris Paul and started, you know, rolling the bubble year. And they started right. rolling and stuff. But – uh you know, it's been tough. Um, it can burn you out a little bit, you know, writing the same thing over and over again. And, you know, I, I, you know, I like to, you know, get in the hoop sometimes and you know, get some analysis. But there's, I mean, all these 30-point losses and blowouts. I mean, you know, as, a, as a guy who just simply played and, like, I can, you know, I feel like a lot in today's, like, sports media landscape, everyone's talking about analytics and, like, um, analytics and advanced metrics and all this stuff. But like, what about just the simple eye test? And the simple eye test is this team's been getting their ass kicked. I don't have any further analysis than that. Um, maybe, maybe the first losing streak, you can break it down. But at this point, it's been the, 
it's been the same shit, you know, over and over and over again, night in and night out. You know, with a few surprise wins here and there, that you didn't think they had in them, but they decided to step up that night. But um, that can be a little draining. Um, but you know, overall, I still love what I do. Um, you know, I, you know, love the daily news for giving me opportunity to you know move to New York, be close for my family, and get to cover this team, um, whether they're good or not. Uh, you know, I, I just appreciate the, the fact that I'm employed in this you know crazy um journalism landscape right now but uh you know the things about sports is you know there's ebbs and flows and you know everyone's due for their you know their winning season eventually so i know this was a down year uh for the nets and i know it's super disappointing for fans but like i said you guys have been a little more fortunate than other nba franchises over the last eight or so years in terms of you know, making the playoffs and, you know, bringing in some stars and stuff like that. I mean, I grew up a Wizards fan and we've been, they've been in purgatory my entire life. <laughs> so, um, Nets fans, I'd say definitely count for blessings. Um, this too shall pass as uh, all things do. And, uh, I'll keep, uh, doing my best to bring you guys, um, solid reporting, um, on a daily basis about your favorite team. And thank you for allowing me, um, to cover your team and, um, you know, for all the support I've gotten online uh, this year with my stories. Back a little bit more, though. I appreciate some more retweets from you guys. Uh, but I get it. It's, it's been rough and not a lot to be happy about. So I get that. But uh, just know whether the team's good or bad, I'm going to do my best to bring you guys the best coverage I can. Shout out to CJ Holmes, senior Nets writer for NY Daily News. You can follow CJ at CJ Holmes 22 on Twitter. CJ, I appreciate it. You know, it's times like these, like, 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 obviously you said the check's still clear. We have the choice to root for any team, to watch what we want to watch each night. And real Nets fans, no matter if they have KD, Kyrie, or, or, or uh, Harden, if their best player's Cam Thomas, if their freaking best player's Devin Harris, we're still going to watch. We're still going to support the organization. Um, and and having people like like you who cover this team, who, who, who try to find – you know, the, the light when there's a lot of darkness and stick with it. And, and, uh, we just appreciate you. Uh, so if you do not follow CJ on Twitter, go follow him at CJ Holmes 22. Like I mentioned, thank you so much for, for joining me a ton this year. We'll get you back on in the off season and next year. And thanks to everyone for tuning in to another edition of fireside nets, episode 193. Catch you guys on the fireside. <laughs>